Wow, everybody decided to come out for standards and interoperability at 11 a.m. <laughs> so my name is Kate Wilson. I'm a senior program officer with PATH in our health information systems team. And it's my distinct pleasure today to be your moderator on a subject that I think is um, incredibly important uh, but often sometimes gets overlooked. One of the things I'd like to really emphasize is some of the themes I think that have come out over the last day or so and even some on Sunday is that increasingly people are talking about government-owned and driven health systems, how those systems can scale, and fundamentally taking a more systems approach to what is an enterprise architecture and how the individual components of a health information system will work together. So how do you get actually this interchange? Because people have been talking about that a lot. And one of the things I want to kind of tie this discussion of standards and interoperability into this morning is that we're really talking about health systems that scale and what are the things that are required. And those are primarily components of both a functional architecture and a technical architecture. And we're going to really be looking today at the information architecture, the data applications. And we're blessed to have three speakers who are really living and implementing on the ground as we speak. Um, first, we have Chris Siebricks, who's the executive director and co-founder of Gembi. Um, Chris, if you have not had the pleasure of hearing him speak before, is really an amazing enterprise architect with deep informatics background. And he's going to talk to us a lot about some of the work that's been done that jembi has been leading with others in Rwanda over the last year. Uh, Chris uh, w comes to us from South Africa, so he's spending time across many geographies in Africa. Uh, Andy Cantor is then going to follow up. Andy works at Columbia University but has a deep background also in informatics, uh, both in the private sector and then in his role leading uh, the Columbia International eHealth Lab as also the Millennium Villages Project. Rowena Luck is a senior in engineer with Damagi, and she's been a pro product owner for ComCare Mobile Logistics and also has been uh, implementing systems across Africa in over 10 countries. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. I want to thank you all um, for coming today. And we'll spend about 15 minutes at the end covering questions. Right, thanks very much, Kate. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Sebrex, as uh, Kate mentioned. And uh, I've given, been given the task of trying to uh, speak a little bit about enterprise architecture. Um, and I'm also doubling in for Richard Gakuba uh, from the uh, EL coordinator from Rwanda who wasn't able to make it to the meeting. So I've put together a, um, a presentation which uh, starts off with some of the basic concepts in EA. Um, it's a very difficult subject actually to speak about, um, but what I'll do is try and cut through that and get to the actual implementation in Rwanda, which shows a practical demonstration of EA at work. Great. So um, some sort of background as to what we, what we understand as enterprise architecture. Um, so we like to think of it as a coherent approach to designing systems that tries to harmonize aesthetic business and technical considerations. Um, the aim is to improve desirable properties of the system through a coherent design process, and those desirable properties are usually determined by the strategic plan providing the architecture vision. So as we go through some of the methodologies and frameworks that have been developed um, to, uh, around enterprise architecture, these are some of the core essences that, that we've had to take out. I think in the environment that we work in, low resource settings, uh, we can't always um, uh, or we have to pair um, methodologies and techniques down to the essential components that work for us. And uh, these are the ones that we distill out. The key properties there are the fact that we work according to, we are implementation driven, so we work according to the strategic plan within a country, and we try to harmonize all of the systems that are currently within the, within the country around the EA approach. So this um, slide that I, I, I've borrowed from David Lubinsky, um, a colleague of, of uh, Kate's from PATH, uh, we use repeatedly to try and summarize uh, what the general approach is. Um, and uh, you can start at various 
various quadrants. Uh, we like to start at the bottom right hand one, which is country health solutions. So um, that's uh, the implementation driven approach that we follow. So a lot of us are involved in building actual implementations or information systems in country. So we start there. So what are we trying to achieve with the EA approach? We're trying to inject some architectural design into that. As we iteratively improve these solutions, we try and extract from that a country e-health architecture, so rather than just building solutions um, as standalones every time, we try to build that according to an architecture, and then moving across to top left is we try and extract from that um, a global health architecture. And as, as I speak through some of these slides, I'll try to constantly go back to this diagram, uh, because I think this is a very profound diagram which is um, governing a lot of uh, the methodologies or the approach that we follow these days. So a few slides just on enterprise architecture for those who don't know it. Um, one of the core concepts within EA is that of a framework. Um, so we try to create a framework which is more or less like a classification system. And um, based on that we create um, artifacts. So that diagram, which is one of the original Zachman Enterprise Architecture Framework, shows a classification scheme um, and all of the different artifacts that would make up an enterprise architecture. So when we talk about an enterprise architecture, we're trying to say what are the core elements and design elements that we would need to ensure that we have a complete solution in country. And this kind of schema tries to, tries to do that. It tries to say these are all of the models and um, architectural artifacts that you would need or that it's a kind of toolkit that you can use to try and describe the information systems uh, that you are, are working on. And uh, this is more or less how it would be elaborated. Again, I should have pointed out, you don't need to worry about the detail. It's really just trying to show you or give you a flavor for some of the um, tools that enterprise architects use. This is Zachman applied to the, um, to the health domain or an aspect of the health domain. And although the Zachman framework has been around for a very long time, there's still um, a large number of people that actually use it um, to classify um, the different artifacts that they are working with. So this is put together and, um, as I say, people, people use this to go through and do gap analyses on this to try and find out um, if there are aspects that they're not covering. Some uh, framework which is more uh, modern and commonly used is the Open Groups Architectural Framework. And uh, this diagram to the left shows the architecture development methodology. So this is another typical EA approach where you have a methodology which describes how you go from the framework to an actual architecture in country. So you have uh, the, um, the framework which uh, prescribes the, uh, some of the patterns and tools that you can use and then you instantiate that within a particular country and uh, the ADM describes a kind of 10-step process that you go through to construct an architecture on a country-specific basis. And um, it's all centered around requirements management uh, is at the core of that. And um, what we've done in Rwanda is we've essentially used um, these uh, methodologies, uh, but we've, as I said earlier, we've had to um, streamline them in order to make them useful in the country, otherwise the time scale would have been too long. So some of the health specific frameworks that are out there, this is the Health Metrics Network framework, which also was applied widely in Africa, um, but also was a, was a way of classifying the different kind of information systems that countries should be focusing on. So it's trying to say, um, let's look at the artifacts that are commonly used and um, these are the, uh, that we should be seeing in country. So HMN spent um, a lot of time helping countries develop these specific um, information system artifacts. And then this is a, uh, another uh, framework that we use or that we've evolved towards um, and was used in Rwanda, which sort of mix and matches some of the um, uh, technologies from the different methodologies, mostly from TOGAF, we have the um, capacity building is a critical part, uh, very important in our environment. And then the ADM itself the, uh, methodol is used as our methodology. And then we've put a lot of emphasis on the development and um, sharing of assets uh, because we're trying to promote reuse in a resource-constrained environment is we've developed um, 
We've partnered with others to develop uh, repositories and registries for that. Okay, so if we remember that uh, moving on to now the um, application of this in Rwanda, um, as we saw from the beginning of the methodology, we start out with the architectural vision, and that's usually provided by the country, or should be provided by the country. So this was the Rwanda eHealth strategy pictogram that uh, Dr. Gukuba has put together, and it uh, sort of explains on one page uh, what the foundational components are within Rwanda, um, as well as the major benefits or the expected outcomes of the EA approach, and what are the pillars or the different health domains that, um, or information systems that will be used to, um, to get to that. And then that then in turn has been summarized again on a single page here where all of the different information systems are elaborated. And again, don't worry about the detail, which you won't be able to read anyway. Um, but I'm trying to give you a flavor for what are the, um, the common beginnings for the EA project that we work with. So um, being driven by this, uh, you can see that uh, these are the sort of, um, this is the start of the project and we use that as our cue um, to build the whole architecture based on that. So moving from that previous schematic, uh, which comes from the country of Rwanda, we take that and we start modeling that. So this is the um, uh, a model, a uh, information system uh, model, which has been developed using Archimate. So it's trying to get a little bit more rigorous about what the country sees as its strategic priorities in terms of information systems. So what we are trying to do with the EA approach here is, is kind of tightly link the development of the technology to the vision. So we try and understand exactly what the country is trying to achieve and then through technologies interpret that. And uh, the, the modeling helps us do that. Uh, that in turn, um, I'm skipping a few steps here and we, we obviously went through a whole lot of um, phases where we refined all of these models. Um, but eventually we uh, got this down to a particular technology framework. So um, through, the, through the business modeling that we did, we came up with a technology framework which really en encapsulated for us what were the core um, goals that Rwanda wanted to achieve. And this uh, is an interoperability framework which was uh, the most uh, relevant project within the country. I think it's worth explaining that within uh, resource limited uh, settings uh, where a lot of these projects are driven by donor funding and by limited resources, <clears throat> pardon me, from the ministry side, um, we can't spend a huge amount of time on doing uh, analysis and um, it's very important to get very quickly from an analysis phase or an architectural development phase to actually implementation. So um, what, we, what we did in terms of our approach was to move through a fairly rigorous but streamlined architectural development process uh, to get down to a technology design that we felt would have maximum benefit for the country. And that's what this came out. This is essentially um, based on a pattern which has been implemented in Canada, the Canada Health InfoWay, and uh, it's a three-layer model which has an interoperability layer which provides connectivity for point of care applications in among themselves and then also connects it to um, registries as uh, core services. Uh, that was then instantiated um, after having been built as a logical model. We were then able to actually develop that uh, with two point of care applications in country, namely OpenMRS and RapidSMS, which are um, implemented at a, at a national level. Uh, one of the aims of this uh, architecture is to uh, provide harmony between these applications and to provide access to those particular services as well as a shared health record and terminology services. So these were seen to be the, um, the, big, the, 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 the quickest way to achieve benefit from this architectural approach to actual systems working on the ground. And uh, this was then instantiated in Rwanda and went live in September of this year in one district in Rwanda for maternal and child health. Um, and it was instantiated, that architecture was instantiated um, using a set of open source and open communities. 
So um, we have open MRS and rapid SMS as a point of care applications. We have the open health information mediator, which is an orchestration service developed on top of Mule, another open source enterprise service bus. And then we have various open source communities which maintain the different registries. So the DHIS and INSTEAD are maintaining an open uh, facilities registry, intra-health uh, professions registry, open EMPI, the master patient index and client registry, open MRS again on the shared health record, and Apollon terminology services. So the outcome of this architectural approach was to get a whole lot of communities together, open source communities who had been developing software, open source software, um, essentially around those functions to um, to get together and to support one architecture, uh, which, as I mentioned, was uh, rolled out successfully in Rwanda in September. And there's now a, a subsequent phase to this project called the Open HIE, the Open Health Information Exchange, which is going to take this to the next level. And um, these were just some of the artifacts I thought I'd show um, that went alongside that. It wasn't only about uh, developing that architecture. Um, there were a number of architectural tools that were, were developed alongside this. This is a terminology service or a web-based terminology service that sits on top of Apollon um, to provide access to the terminologies uh, which are, with, with, that are being used within Rwanda. The um, Hinjex or the health, um, the health in ingenuity exchange was another project that we're involved with developing, which is a registry and repository for architect architectural artifacts. So these are all key elements of, of the TOGAF approach as well, um, and were things that we developed along the road into doing this. And then coming back to David Lubinsky's diagram, um, I think you can see the approach that we followed is to go full circle through this, starting with a, a need in Rwanda, an implementation-driven approach, i.e. bottom right-hand quadrant, moving up to a health architecture for Rwanda, which, was, which is the architecture which has been rolled out. And now the open HIE approach is moving across to top left. Uh, so we're creating a global health architecture, i.e. a particular um, open um, health information exchange which is, um, and registries which are now being applied in a number of other countries and then moving back down to creating global health solutions. So that has really been our approach to architecture. Um, some of the other aspects that have come out, this is the... Um, Again, generalizing the vision, ISO 14639, they took that uh, strategic diagram that Richard Gukuba elaborated for Rwanda and used that to build um, a general standard for architectural development in low resource settings. And this is ISO 14639 technical report, which has been done. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andy Cantor, and I'm from Columbia University. And I wear many different hats, but I'm going to try to talk to you today about uh, two of the main ones that we've been doing here um, in the eHealth and mHealth area, specifically around standards and interoperability. And although I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Millennium Villages project and was pretty involved in the initial formulation of the architecture and plans, there are many other people who are more deeply involved in the implementation point from this uh, point on, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions when it comes to that part in the presentation. So I'm going to quickly go through in 15 minutes or so to tell you a little bit about MVP, the Millennium Global Village Network approach, which is the architecture and e-health integration project that I'm going to talk about, followed by a, a focus on semantic interoperability, because much of the talk that you hear in terms of enterprise architecture and having systems uh, communicate with one another focuses on the um, connectivity and not so much on the meaning, and I'm going to talk about the meaning. Then I'm going to change gears a little bit to, to describe to you a, a process that we've gone through in Ethiopia for a national scale-up of an mHealth project for health extension workers there, and finally some lessons learned and conclusions. So how many people actually have already heard about the Millennium Villages project? I know Jeff was speaking yesterday. 
So I'll go over this really relatively quickly. Um, it is a partnership between the Earth Institute, the Millennium um, Promise, which is an NGO, the United Nations Development Project, and specifically national governments in 10 different countries. It's around uh, 14 different agroecological uh, zones. So the idea was that if anything um, sort of didn't work or <laughs> did work in a particular area within Africa, that it couldn't be said that it would only work in that area. Um, it's integrated development, so it's a science-based approach looking at specifically how education, agriculture, health, business development, capacity building can all be used together at a fixed price in a scalable fashion. So one of the major differences between MVP and many other pilot projects is that scale up and sustainability was there from the very, very beginning. We cover about half a million people in these different countries in groups of about uh, 50,000 uh, at a time. And generally, there's uh, our primary health care system involves three to six clinics in each of these clusters in, uh, in the 14 different sites. So from the very beginning, we had a really difficult problem, and that was we had these countries that we had to work in. So we're talking about everything from Ethiopia to Ghana, um, Nigeria, Mali, Tanzania, Uganda, multiple different countries, different languages, different ministries of health, different reporting requirements, and so there was an interoperability issue from the very start of our project, and we needed a design process that was going to take into account this uh, reality on the ground. So we came up with the Millennium Villages Global Network, and it might have been possible to uh, create our own system to basically sort of start from scratch and say, okay, this is just like many um, large organizations would do, this is going to be the MVP system. And we really didn't want to do that. And I don't know if people are familiar with the, the classic sort of standards conundrum, but um, there's been a really fascinating discussion on many of the listservs in the informatics community recently about standards and whether vendors can implement standards. And so the problem is not so much that there aren't standards. Um, there are lots of standards. So here's a situation where there are 14 competing standards. Some people come in and say, oh, uh, 14, this is ridiculous. We need to develop a universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. Yeah. And then soon there's 15 competing standards. So we didn't want to get into that situation. We felt it was essential very early on to pick and choose from standards to make sure that the system would um, be able to function um, in an interoperable fashion without actually creating a new standard. So MVGNet was designed primarily to um, put together a series of components. You've already heard a little bit about OpenMRS from the Rwanda situation as our longitudinal medical store and essentially the electronic medical record. We had um, key other open source components that were uh, chosen initially was rapid SMS and the child count system that was using essentially SMS messages between community health workers and the uh, centralized repository. Uh, we were using um, mClinic or open data kit uh, also to capture data from uh, clinical workstations and smartphones within the field. And um, now the Millennium Villages project has been moving due to difficulties around um, reliability of SMS messaging and carrier availability in many of our countries to uh, ComCare, which is another open source system that you will hear more about, which involves, um, uh, again, a standard-based approach. So what we did was pick XForms, for example, as a way to communicate between the field uh, devices and the centralized repository. I see the batteries going on this, um, that we used uh, the SDMX HD uh, standard to communicate between the uh, individual patient data and aggregated reports through using DHIS2. These are then able to roll up to the Ministry of Health level. On our um, top level system, we're also looking at uh, essentially mapping our data into a uh, data mart initially aggregated data, but also individual uh, row-level de-identified data. And I'll talk a little bit about how the encoding systems are done here. But essentially, the point, key point being open source applications allowing customization and, uh, and um, uh, design integration within local implementations, but yet retaining common data dictionary, 
and standards to communicate between them. Now, these are the ones that we picked. There are um, many others that could potentially be there, and that's an important distinction whether you have a top-down sort of system like in Rwanda where you pretty much architect the um, information system from the top down or a more bottom-up system the way we had with all these different systems in different countries that we knew had to eventually communicate with one another and therefore we made investments in the choice of the different applications and the way those applications communicate. You'll hear more about APIs and so on from Rowena in a minute. But that was the way we insisted that there would be interoperability as the systems uh, expanded. We currently have 13 different servers running in 10 different countries. This just gives you a, an idea of the amount of data that we have at this point. Over 700,000 patients, um, 3 million encounters, many of which were entered through handheld devices um, in the field, in home visits, uh, leading to about 14 million observations. So a lot of different data and a lot of different systems that are being um, reported not only locally, but also from an MVP point of view, from a project level, therefore having um, the ability to interoperate the data. Now, one of the things that we learned very early on was that this information had to be um, uh, available not just in electronically, but also actionable. And that the data, if I wanted to report on malaria, it was not sufficient to know that, you know, I have malaria in two different sites, but I need to know that when someone's talking about paludisma in French-speaking uh, Francophone country, um, or when they're talking about malaria in, in Rwanda or in, in Kenya, that I know what the malaria is that they're talking about. And so that requires amount of semantic interoperability or the ability to transfer meaning between systems. And this is probably the number one failure in system architecture now is that people go out and they think about how electronic systems talk to one another, but they don't talk really about what the language those systems are speaking. And is a person on one end of the system um, able to understand what the other person is saying? So an essential component and one of the key elements of Millennium Village Global Network was a central data dictionary. So using controlled medical terminology allows me within my health system to know that when I say malaria, I actually know I'm talking about this infectious disease caused by paludisma or um, uh, falciparum or whatever one of the, the, the organisms are. But that if we want to be able to share that information not outside of my system, both with international organizations like WHO, but also within other systems within my own country, I need to be able to map to standardized codes. And that allows us these reference terms to, to actually allow meaning to transfer between different systems. Now, it's not enough even just to say malaria is malaria or paludisma is malaria, but you also need to have an ontology that allows you to um, move up and down levels of specificity. So a real classic example of this is in one country, they may capture, <coughs> excuse me, malaria as um, either uh, confirmed through smear or through RDT or unconfirmed malaria. Now that's a level of specificity that I might code my um, information that's going into the, inf into the medical record, whereas in another country they just care whether or not it's malaria. Now computers are, um, they don't think in an analog, they're digital. So in other words, malaria confirmed by a smear is not the same thing as malaria. And if you try to match those two things up, it will not, they'll tell you it's not the same thing. And when you want to do a report, you have a problem. So you need a hierarchy to essentially be able to move at different levels so that in one country you may be able to have malaria with confirmed by smear and another country where it's just malaria suspected and know that those are both malaria. And that's an essential piece to this. And then finally, you need to have these administrative codes. And most people are probably familiar with like ICD or, um, or ICD-10 for most of the countries that are reporting. This country soon will be switching to ICD-10-CM. And that's not only essential for reporting, but also for reimbursement. And as we move into the universal health care and in inter integration with insurance, um, this is an essential piece that cannot be missed. Now, the point I want to make simply here is that systems designed for billing and reimbursement do not have the level of clinical granularity necessary to take care of patients or to provide decision support. And therefore, it's not enough if you have an insurance system to simply use those codes at the front line. And that's one of the other features of having the centralized dictionary is that the clinical codes are available for clinical users, and those are mapped to the administrative codes and reference terms for interoperability, billing, and reporting. So the dictionary that's at the core of our uh, system is the CIL concept dictionary. It contains information about diseases, procedures, and medications, almost 50,000. 
These, as I mentioned, are mapped to individual reference terminologies, and there are different terminologies that are different domains. Now, SNOMED CT is very comprehensive. It generally covers a lot of the um, domains that we need to work in, but it's not overall completely comprehensive. And so you need, for example, LOINC so when you're um, using observations or laboratories. We use RxNorm, uh, open source, again, terminology used for uh, medication management and documentation. And then ICD-10 for uh, reporting and for international reporting and CVX codes for immunizations. You can see that um, we have a lot of different maps, and this is a substantial amount of work to keep these all mapped. And we have these in multiple languages so that people who are interfacing with this terminology in their local settings are actually seeing it in the language that they would be expected to use it. I'm going to change gears slightly here to talk now about what has happened in Ethiopia because it was a latter project that was developed specifically around um, requests by the Ministry of Health um, to the Gates Foundation to define a roadmap for use of mHealth tools in their health extension worker program. Um, uh, Ethiopia was a, like most countries now in Africa, I, I wish I also had the picture from Uganda that showed every uh, different project that was working in all the different areas of the country, but we were s basically surrounded with multiple different pilots, none of which, perhaps with the exception of the MVP system that was really designed for scale up or for a, inter or for a national health information system. And so one of the challenges was how to get from this environment, rather than um, in Rwanda kind of a top-down approach, but how to come up from this to a system that would allow each of these players to function within a national system within Ethiopia. So um, this was actually designed on kind of a, a building approach. We started with a project that was done, also funded by the Gates Foundation and Vital Wave Consulting to do an mHealth roadmap partly assessing the, um, the landscape of who the players were and what the key elements or needs that were of the Health Extension Worker Program in the country. And then we used that and combined that with um, PATH and their experience within uh, enterprise architecture and supply chain management in Ethiopia, Tanzania, Ghana, and Zambia to try to implement a system that would be designed for Ethiopia that wouldn't start from scratch. And of course, we also had the Millennium Villages Project as an example, too. So we went through a second stage, which really involved design specifications and an initial pilot implementation. And I use the word pilot very cautiously, but the idea being that there needed to be validation within the country of the methodology that was being used with the eventual intention of expanded rollout through all of the country. So the ministry was very clear at the beginning that this wasn't just a documentation or a strategic uh, research project, but rather it needed to be a real operational plan for how we were going to achieve 38,000 health extension workers across across the country. So part of this process was really a uh, designing a uh, interaction participatory approach that would allow us to um, capture the information we needed. We had workshops and uh, sessions with each individual uh, player to um, stakeholders to identify what the functional requirements needed to be. It was very interactive. It was really um, a useful way of eliciting both the information um, model requirements as well as sort of operational necessities for the systems. And what we ended up with was a roadmap document, which had the vision. It had a shared principles for implementation, including standards and operability, need for integration, key process flows for mater uh, health extension workers, particularly around maternal child health, and functional requirements all were part of this document. And essentially where we were was a process of um, developing a system at the early stages to cover data management, data exchange and supply chain management to start, but yet do it in a way that could build in an interoperable and scalable fashion, adding in new functions along the way, each one then expanding to a larger number of districts. So Wareda is their equivalent of a district. So that by the end of these series of waves, um, hopefully by 2015, that there would be m maximum um, involvement of the district in, with a maximum um, functional requirement. And so again, just to sort of quickly wrap up, there's the system looks very similar to what we learned from the Millennium um, Villages project. It's slightly different uh, in that we have 
um, a MoTeC server here working um, for decision support, community health workers using ComCare, probably something like OpenMRS or um, SmartCare here in the middle for data stores, and then eventually reporting up to the government through an aggregate reporting system with GIS. Again, leveraging standards as a way for these uh, t technologies to talk to one another, not necessarily naming a given software product for each one of those places, but the standards in which they would be uh, uh, used. So just let me now finish by the lessons learned. The first thing really was that open source platforms were essential both from the fact that they'd allowed for local customizations, it allowed us to integrate within these different systems by applying standards to existing open source, source packages if they didn't already have them. And this gave us a tremendous amount of flexibility. The participatory process, particularly in Ethiopia, was essential for getting user feedback and the requirements. And again, if we were using a private um, closed system, it would be very hard to make the changes necessary to meet those, so that was essential. Um, we needed a data model that was expandable, and we is, knew from the very start that this was going to be an iterative process, that we didn't have all of the priority indicators that we needed at the very beginning. We would start with a low-hanging fruit and then build upon that in a way with a maturity model that allowed our technology to keep up with the changes that we knew from um, project management and from just medicine in general. Everything was mapped to reference standards and a centralized concept dictionary, both for um, interoperability within our own systems, but also for the global interoperability and semantic interoperability. And then we spent a lot of time, which many people forget about, which is really focusing on localization of content and concepts so that people at different levels, not just different languages, but that nurse midwives, that community health workers, and maybe clinicians, and even patients within those environments have access to this knowledge in a way that's reusable and understandable. And that donors and government and NGO stakeholders are essential to have at the very beginning. So I want to thank, really, because this isn't my work, it's the work of just a tremendous amount of people, um, Millennium Village Project. In each of those countries, there's a team of local people doing this work, the Earth Institute and Millennium Promise, the Ethiopia FMOH for their leadership, and um, also for their commitment to using interoperable and standards-based systems in their country, and then finally our funders, uh, IDRC, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Rockefeller. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming out to our panel today. My name is Rowena, and I'm going to be talking to you about standards and interoperability from the perspective of Damagi. For those of you who don't know who we are yet, um, we're a small technology consulting firm, but also market leaders in the space of developing mobile technologies for global health. Our philosophy is very open and collaborative, so everything we develop is open source. And in each of the many countries that we work in, we really focus on building the right partnerships, both in-country and internationally, to make a success for the given initiative. Now, we've worked on a lot of different systems, everything from small-scale proof-of-concept research projects to large deployments at scale. Uh, in countries like India, Uganda, Zambia, or Tanzania, and it's really in the large countries that we've had to work with and resolve these issues of interoperability and integra integration. Um, as I mentioned, we like to collaborate, and so some of our experience in this space is co-founding the Open Rosa Consortium, which is focused on mobile data collection standards. We co-founded um, Java Rosa, which created the XForms platform that it powers many of the open source mobile data collection systems out there. Co-founded Rapid SMS, one of the leading SMS systems out there. Co-founded Coded in Country for uh, promoting in-country software development capacity. And then more recently, we've been involved in co-founding the Open Facility Registry Service, which is one of a set of registries which is envisioned as comprising the part of the Open Health Information Exchange, which Chris mentioned a little bit, but also being able to expand that beyond Rwanda to other countries. And finally, two of our um, core products, uh, one is uh, our integrated parts of the MoTeC suite. So we have ComCare, which is our mobile application job aid for community health workers, and then ComTrack, which is our mobile logistics solution. And those have been integrated with leading tools um, from groups such as Grameen, Instead, Village Reach, ThoughtWorks, um, so that they can provide a set of mobile health functionality to serve frontline health workers. 
So we built a lot of systems. Um, we've gotten these systems to talk to each other. And clearly we've done a fair amount in the space of interoperability. What do we think? Well, it's a lot of work. Clearly, you know, there's people from the private sector, the public sector, funders, NGOs, et cetera. And at the end of the day, it's a task of bringing them all into a room and getting them to agree on one thing. And that's, you know, that's a bit of a process of herding cats. So, um, yeah, it reminds me of this, uh, this sign I once saw for a handyman advertising his rates. So it was something like $20 an hour to fix your stuff for you, $30 an hour if you wanted to watch, and $40 an hour if you wanted to help. And it's not, it's not a perfect analogy, but I feel like it, it sort of gets across the point that you can have, you know, well-intentioned, capable people trying to all contribute to an effort, and it just slows things down to a crawl sometimes. And this is particularly acute uh, in an environment or a space that we're talking about where we say we have the buy-in of a country. Uh, and really what that means is that we have a buy-in of a few important people at the ministry. And they can be worlds apart from what a local district health information officer is dealing with in a given, you know, rural, remote part of that country. Another disconnect uh, which comes up a lot is that you might have a, you know, more theoretical or academic model of interoperability and how it should work, which is probably more correct. And what happens when that runs up against an environment where we are working with limited resources and we just, you know, don't have the time or the energy or the, or the money to make it go just perfect. Here we have an axiom which I think anyone who works in standards and interoperability will agree with, and that is that whether something is used uh, is more important than whether it's perfectly right. Um, so at the end of the day, it's going to be the folks on the ground running the programs, making ends meet, that decide whether everything that we talk about here is a success or whether it's just a document that rots in a shed somewhere. And we have to remember that those people, they're they're working on nickels and dimes. You know, they have too many things to do, too few hours in the day, too little resources to cover too great of a task. Let's not forget that, you know, healthcare has a long way to go independent of M Health. M Health has a long way to go independent of interoperability, and interoperability has a long way to go. Uh, in Canada, where I'm from, and I remember uh, Chris uh, mentioned the Canada Info Highway, and I believe we're taking you know, a fair amount of inspiration from the successes that uh, have happened in Canada. But today, I can't stand in the largest hospital in the largest city in the country and walk next door and get access to basic laboratory results from that first hospital that I was in. And so, you know, I would think it's a kind of incredible arrogance to think that um, you know, we might be able to walk into these countries and work and say that we know what we're doing, to say that we're going to get it right the first time. I'll tell you now, we won't. It's going to take time. In that vein, I, I would suggest that we approach the problem with a certain amount of humility. You know, we need to remember that we don't have all the answers and we're not working with a lot of resources here. You know, the first time that I flew into Accra in Ghana, I remember seeing all these, uh, these frames for these mansions that they were building in the city. And I thought, wow, you know, the city is really growing. There's so much construction happening. And then I came back the next year, and those frames are still there, and the next year, and the next year, and those frames are still there right now. Obviously, what had happened was that whoever had, you know, planned or budgeted for those houses hadn't, hadn't actually planned far enough to have people living in those houses. And that's my concern with interoperability and standards. You know, there's a role for them, but I'm, I'm worried that we'll spend so much time, you know, writing specifications and having these meetings and, you know, drafting up a perfect way to do it that we might not get it to the ground fast enough for it to be useful. And that disconnect that I was talking about earlier between, like, MOH and the rural areas, just imagine how, how great that disconnect becomes when we talk about the gap between, you know, D.C. and Nairobi. So we need to remember there aren't a lot of big players. These systems haven't scaled widely, and the capacity to consume standards is limited in a lot of these countries. So am I saying that we should just give up on interoperability? Well, not quite. Um, systems need to be able to talk to each other one way or another. Organizations and governments deserve to have access to data. They need to be able to make decisions on the basis of this data. They need to have the freedom to take their data and move it into you know, whatever software platform can best meet the needs that they're trying to address on the ground. 
I guess what I'm saying is that there's many ways to get systems to talk to each other before we get as far as an international gold standard or as, before we get as far as a full you know, health information exchange. There's definitely a role for health information exchange in some countries in some contexts, but that's not the only answer. Standards will add value, but they will take time. Um, for now, I think we can, you know, we can start with things like open APIs, open data, making sure that there is a way to access the information, that the way to access that information is well documented. Um, if there is a standard that's out there that is appropriate um, and that is uh, possible to implement within the resources of a given project, then it makes sense to, to, you know, to do that research and to know that it's there and to use it. But if something appropriate doesn't exist, well, let's, let's, you know, make some, let's do the best that we can and get those projects up and running and go. What I don't want to see happen is I don't want to see these projects blocked which we've seen in a few countries, actually, already, um, where they say, you know, we can't, we can't move forward because we don't have the whole architecture figured out. We don't have all the answers. We're not going to have all the answers for a very long time. And it's really sad to see this, you know, the innovation and the energy that happens in these different pockets um, held back by years for some international consortium to come to agreement on something which won't even be right the first time around. So what we need to recognize is that it's a process, um, it's going to take time, and it's going to be different in different countries, and we're going to need to iterate on that. To borrow from agile software development, there's this, this motto of fail fast. And the idea here is that you want your failures to happen quickly so you can learn and so you can perfect with something that is useful you know, in the real world. And finally, for, for funders in this space, I would argue that when we initiate these projects, the goal should not be to you know, create another specification or to create a certification process or to set up another committee or write up a lessons learned document and whatnot. The goal should be something tangible that we can hold on to and be proud of. You know, it should be something like, let's get health system A, like in, in addition to all those other things which might be you know, part of the process, but you know, the primary goal of what you're getting to is let's have health system A talk to health system B and draw information from health system B that is actually used to improve healthcare delivery in these communities in a way that matters to those people in the community in a significant way, in a way that they care about. Um, healthcare improvement, I guess that's, you know, that's why we're all here. That's the goal, and we should remember that. And interoperability is just a means to get to that goal. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you for those excellent presentations. And I thought there were just a couple of themes that kind of emerged that I just wanted to tie back together and then open the floor for questions. And if people want to line up for questions, that would be great. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think it's, you know, Chris really highlighted the degree to which going to scale requires architecture and a focus on standards and how you're going to do interoperability. Yet, as Rowena highlighted and pointed out again, which is don't let the perfect be an enemy of the done. Like, you do need to move forward and make steps. The second thing that I think was that, you know, how we actually all think about involving countries in this, that, that this is not something that's an outside-in process, but should be an inside-out driven process where everyone who's at the table is brought together. And that this is critical not only just for interoperability at the beginning or in specific projects, but again, to have something that's going to last 20 or 30 years from now recognizing that it will look completely different than it does today. Applications will change, but how you think about different systems and how they're going to talk together don't necessarily have to. The other thing is that this process and how we think about kind of an agreed upon language, you know, it's, this is not unique to healthcare, but it doesn't necessarily happen as well in healthcare. Yesterday we heard from a gentleman who is a CEO of previously in financial services. This has been done in many other places. Shipping, financial services, you don't think about these things anymore. Can we get to the point in healthcare, whether it be in the developing world or the developed, where we no longer think about this? And I guess last but not least, you know, kind of, you know, as each of the speakers kind of pointed out, how do you think about kind of a crawl, walk, run scenario around this, which is don't try and boil the ocean over time. Yes, standards and interoperability are important, but don't try and make it so complex at the beginning that you don't have time for anything else. 
Um, and I'd like to ask the gentleman in the front maybe to start off with questions. Hi, Ed Bunker from Chapago and JHU. Um, I, sitting here listening, particularly uh, to you, Rowena, at the end, I, I, I had to think that maybe we needed to do a little bit of like family therapy. Um, so I wanted to start off by, by, by asking Chris, how did you feel about what Rowena said? Because um, you, uh, you seem to be the target of something that she said about, you know, kind of creating these reports that get, that get, uh, that, uh, or the, these requirements documents that get, that get created. So, so how did you feel about what she said? <laughs> I said they had a role. I didn't say they, we didn't need them at all. <laughs> Just to clarify. Anyway, I'm going to sort out afterwards. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, I think that was really what we tried to do. I think we, um, we we tried to adopt an enterprise architecture approach, and we were doing this in in the early days of trying to apply this to healthcare. And and I think we used many of the principles that she described. You know, found the things that were not working in terms of EA, and converged on the things that that did work for us, and then went forward with those. So I think that it's this continual thing of getting the balance right. Uh, so I think a degree of architectural design is important. Don't get into analysis paralysis. Don't go and generate huge amount of documentation because it's unlikely to, to be useful, particularly in a low resource setting. But um, there's no doubt in my mind that a degree of architectural design is hugely beneficial. And I think that although I may not have seen it at this point in Rwanda, I mean, the fact that this technology that's been developed and the designs are now being used in a range of other countries, I think this is what we always wanted to get to, where we would see the benefits in terms of economies of scale where, there's, where it's reused in other settings. So it will come into its own once you get to that level, and I think one of the problems we have is that a lot of the projects we work on have a very short time frame. They funded for a particular, for five years or whatever, and people need to get to that goal. So it's very hard to have the benefit of, um, of an architectural approach because you need to put a little bit more into it. It needs to be um, funded. I think uh, John said last year from Damagi, he said that last year, you need to be paid to do it. So we need to build that into the projects, otherwise people aren't going to do it because they've got short uh, time, time horizons. And, uh, but if you do it, you'll see it in subsequent iterations. And I guess I should, I'd also like to add that, like, I think it's, uh, you know, really exciting what's happening in Rwanda. Like, I think it's a, it's a great learning opportunity and whatnot. Um, and so I'm glad that, you know, there has been one country which, you know, has the interest and the funding and the backing to, to try it out. And that in other countries, you know, will, like, there will be bits and pieces, maybe the whole thing, maybe, you know, specific parts of that, that will get uh, reused. And that's, and that's a great learning opportunity. I just wanted to really emphasize that, you know, uh, Rwanda is miles apart from the Central African Republic, which is miles apart from Kenya. And, you know, there, there might end up being very different things out there um, and that it's going to evolve and it's going to change, and we should recognize that. So let me just make one comment about that from the MVP perspective, which I guess to some extent we've been stuck in the middle between the two processes. And um, I think it's essential that there is at least a commitment to an architectural vision, even if you're going to do a grassroots or bottom-up approach, that um, you may not have the opportunity to fully design and implement an architecture from the top down, but if you don't have that commitment um, within, and we pushed back on Damagi to add, you know, standardized codes when there were no standardized codes, because there's no use business case for doing that unless you're thinking, well, this needs to interoperate or this needs to go beyond a certain um, length of time. And so I think that there has to at least be commitment to using standards at the levels where they're appropriate and cost effective. If there isn't, then people will, ju it'll just be the Wild West. So. Uh, I'm Raphael Richards. I'm also from JA2, but I'm also on two other completely bipolar uh, separate committees. I'm on an HL7 standards committee, which is a very top down kind of waterfall approach to approach, and I'm also on W3 uh, Semantic Web Healthcare and Life Sciences uh, group, which is a bottom-up group that believes in semantic interoperability as the, as the primary starting point, which is, I think, a lot of what we want to do in medicine. The word is thrown around about standards, about security, about HIPAA, 
about syntax, about whether things are encapsulated in pipes like HL7 or square brackets like HML, XML. But the packaging that we have now here is, doesn't magically confer any meaning to the data. So going back to something that is core, something like OpenMRS, which is at its foundation, or industry uh, software, which at its foundation requires a data dictionary. Um, I, I would like to, there's a, whole, there's a whole movement out there that is based on open standards, about as open as you get, and it's called the internet, using good old standard uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, protocols. And we, no one can imagine here what HTTP did to transform everyone's life. And only four years later, after developing the HTTP protocol, Tim Berners-Lee realized this document-oriented motif that we're stuck in today with all our CCR, CCDs, and documents that we're downloading and shipping and, and so on, and tangle up in this document-oriented motif, he realized in 93, when he came, much, came up with the RDF protocol, that there's actually data elements inside of these documents that are meaningful, and that you can securely, independently, in a data atomic way, with semantic meaning attached to every one of those pieces, trans transmit data, and just those bits of data that you want around the internet. PCAST report is very clear on this as a standard that they wanted the atomic semantic methodology of a universal language to ship data around the internet. And they said everything but the word RDF and linked data when the PCAST report came out. They didn't, have not used that word. There's now very good use cases for OpenGov data. You're talking about thousands of government databases dumped and converted to RDF, uh, which now allows you to federate and semantically query what we call in, in web terms the mashup of now hundreds and thousands of databases that are sitting there on the inter internet as the web of data rather than the web of pages. And there is now uh, more and more use cases. BBC uh, uh, specifically uses it, LinkedIn uses it, a lot of websites use it as their back end technology. Big Pharma, all the omics, the genomics and proteomics communities are using linked data Using, so we're managing ontologies and dictionaries at a much higher abstract level, giving you true semantic interoperability. And so I would like to see a community build on good old-fashioned internet standards, not the 35-year-old pipes and square brackets that we're kind of stuck in, but actually a, a, a move forward, particularly in the platform of mobile health, where we are starting something completely brand new. And uh, I would like your feelings between... Now, I'm, I'm conflicted. I'm HL7, and I'm and I'm W3C, I'm both, and I've seen both sides of the coin. And I do see uh, this possibility, particularly in developing nations where you don't have entrenched um, interests. And it's precisely in the context where you described in developing world and in the micro grassroots buildup that this has a tremendous potential to really transform. <laughs> Sorry about the monologue. Uh, Richard, what was the last name? I didn't catch. Uh, Rich, Richard is the last name. I, uh, oh, sorry. I'm a physician at Johns Hopkins, but okay. I'm on a few other standards committees. Well, it is a tough, um, and I can't say that I can speak to a lot of detail of what you described, but I think one of the difficulties I see is that there's a little bit of an underappreciation of the complexity of healthcare compared to many of these other things. and. Um, in terms of where we have with the internet, just in terms of content, you know, we have a, a very English dominated uh, system where um, you don't actually have a lot of sense of what the individual data elements may mean, although you know where they're supposed to be and what they're, the, the categories around them. And so some of the ontological issues may require some additional curation. And so it, there may be a kind of a blend between a uh, more crowdsourcing, open, open approach with some folks that are uh, spending a lot of time in thinking how those pieces fit together into some kind of an ontology and to represent across different coding systems. I know that, um, you know, just like Wikipedia, you know, that it only works initially um, until you get such a level of granularity and differences that you now can't find what you're looking for without some editorial content. But I think that's a, at least a process that we could start. And there's a, um, as long as we're careful that we're not capturing data that needs to be acted upon later in a way that's not going to grow, I mean, so there needs to be some upfront work. Um, 
one of the lessons that we learned very early on is that if you let people just model their data in their own way, you get data in, the da in, the, in their databases very quickly that then doesn't work going forward as they figure out what they did wrong. So there is an, a, a certain amount of work that has to be done up front. And um, I think that, and I, I, like, I don't think anything happened with PCAST. <laughs> no, but the, 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 big, the big work you're referring to up front is what the federal government has funded in terms of uh, National Library of Medicine, NIH, where they've already API enabled virtually all of their resources, but much more than that, uh, the federal government's put a lot of money into managing the major ontologies of SNOMED, Low Inc., and RX Norm. These are already public property domains and haven't been RDFized yet, but that's on the table and the government is thinking about this. There's already a lot of government data that's been RDFized but it's only one step away before we have an actual true dictionary that at that tr most core bit, the medications, allergies, and problems can be semantically 100% through one common dictionary with no charge and no uh, toll gatekeeper uh, in between, uh, direct, uh, a, a true direct technology from provider to provider uh, mm -hmm. without any toll gatekeepers. Thank you. Could we... Uh the next question, I just want to make sure we get through everyone. Sure. I'm Nick Wilkie, I'm a med student at the uh, University of Vermont. Uh, my question is about how you've uh, interacted with the databases that are already existing in the countries that you're working with, uh, particularly Andy with your work, um, your nationwide rollout. Uh, whether or not you um, interacted with, say, the uh, for a master patient index using their citizenship registry. Uh, and if you did that, what um, what problems you encountered? Maybe you can also, Chris. So for us, we actually there weren't a lot of existing systems, uh, and so that's always an advantage, I suppose. Although um, there is an existing e HMIS system that doesn't necessarily comply to the standards, so there is always going to be a certain amount of legacy work that has to be done in terms of um, upgrading systems to use standard approaches. Um, partly, I think for us, it was a design question is how to use existing systems that were already on the ground or working to provide certain functionalities as opposed to architecting like Rwanda where these registries were built and put above that interoperability level layer and were solely focused on um, a certain function. We don't know yet, it, or it's too early in Ethiopia to know where we're going to run into additional roadblocks where systems can't um, where we're missing like a facility registry or a provider registry. Right now, OpenMRS is, you know, providing that functionality for us. There's a rapid facility assessment that's being done for the facility registries. But I think it's just having those standard or the architectural view from the very beginning that you will be talking to them <laughs> and that everyone needs to rise a little bit to communicate at that level that will allow the interoperability to happen. But there weren't, for East, at least in Ethiopia, there weren't a lot of existing um, uh, databases that we had to interoperate with. Um, just to add on, we didn't talk about it in the context of this session, but uh, PATH actually has partnered uh, with a Dutch NGO and one of the representatives is in the ba Farm Access Foundation. And we actually have been working with 10 countries across both Asia and Africa on a health data dictionary prototyping tool. And what this is, is it's, you know, it's a very simple way for countries to start this process of developing their own health data dictionaries, pulling from what already exists from more sophisticated systems that have been rolled out in Australia and other places, but then allowing countries to kind of compare, if I use namespace in the following way, how do five other countries do that? And there's a variety of, there's both a political process that's involved and there's a small technology process. There's multiple ways you could do it. It's the technology isn't the hard part. It is actually getting the groups together to agree, you know, and Rowena showed, you know, the group sitting in the room. And I mean, that, that happens a lot. And uh, a colleague this morning made the great point which was, you know, technical interoperability really starts with personal interoperability. So we, as we talk about these standards, this is a more technology-focused or standard session, but it really does require those, having many of those people in there, but then making it in a format that can be broadly disseminated and shared and viewed across others in the system. And there's some really interesting things, particularly in the insurance space across countries as countries are pursuing universal health care where they're actually looking at how they do crowdsourcing to determine what their standards are going to be. 
And so there's some really unique things to the prior question that are being done in this that are, that are coming about now. Um, and happy to share those with people after the session as well. Yeah, I definitely want to second that, uh, that statement about it being a very personal process. I think in a lot of the countries we work in, they have, they have something like a birth and death registries, I think, or like some semi-functioning thing that's sort of in that state. And there's always, you know, talk at the ministry level that this is, we're keeping track of people across so many different ministries and can we consolidate that effort? And that's something that we've, you know, we've, we've tried and we've talked to people and that's sort of an ongoing political process that I believe it just keeps on going in a lot of the countries that we've been in. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Dubot. I'm a former World Bank staff. Uh, yes, operability is a nightmare. Uh, it's completely ignored in development projects because it creates headaches. So people choose, for reasons of convenience, standalone solution. And we've been witnesses of that for many, many years. Uh, I was working in the transportation system for the last three years. And a lot is done in terms of interoperability in that sector, including integrating water, energy, and transport. And I'm wondering, I mean, what you've presented here is very interesting. And I'm wondering how much of your work is shared with other sectors, because what we may see happening is a fragmentation of uh, systems, which is completely against what we want to achieve. And what you show here, I see a lot of transfer that can be done in developing countries regarding, I mean, the goal would be to have a national uh, strategy, like countries like Japan, like Korea have, which in a way simplify the work. So I guess I think one observation um, that I'll make on that. that it, yeah, it is, it is amazing how much farther ahead uh, sectors in transportation and finance are uh, with respect to where the health sector is. And, you know, that, that speaks to the complexity in the pol politics around health data. I think it also speaks a bit to the value, like what, what the value of the systems are. Like in finance and transportation, it's, it's all about moving things around and getting things to work together. And so people just need, they need to make it work and so that they make it work. And that's definitely also true in, in the health case as well, like when you're moving between different hospitals or different systems and whatnot. But in, in the health sector, there are so many problems to deal with that. And, you know, so many problems just within one clinic with one nurse and one doctor just getting systems, get, just getting things done. And so with a finite amount of resources, uh, you know, people will focus on the issue of supply chain or focus on the issue of, of training or whatnot. And, th and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why that, uh, you know, that that healthcare interoperability is, is a little bit uh, behind. Yeah, I would also second that. Um, and there may be an area in which, and then we've already seen this already within Ethiopia, that the other ministerial um, departments um, are actually learning from each other and through this whole process because the whole strategic uh, road mapping uh, architecture approach and uh, participatory approach was uh, was not that common within the system and so that there was a lot of cross fertilization between the different sectors and I think there's some hope that this will set a new expectation for how this might work in the future. You know I think the, to highlight the part that Rowena mentioned it's you know human life um, if we spent just even a tenth of what we do to make sure that a bomb falls exactly where it needs to fall to how to make sure that the right drugs are available in that clinic for those sick patients, um, we would have a much healthier planet. Hi, thanks for your presentations. Uh, my name is Jonathan Payne with the InHealth Alliance and the Maternal Concept Lab. And uh, it strikes me that the perspectives that you provided like seemed very different, but they may not be as different as they seem. And um, I think that you know one idea might be that the you know this agile, quick iteration methodology is the appropriate strategy within each of the buckets that fit in the larger enterprise architecture, and that some of these interoperability issues are now coming to the surface that did not before because we're all now talking about scale in a way that we haven't. Um, and so I'm interested, and in, I think. 
I'd be interested to hear all of your perspectives, but Rowena in, in particular, I'd be very curious. Um, that, you know, I think there's a, an optimum level of interoperability that changes depending on the context. Um, you know, and if you go too far into that, it could actually be un bad, you know, it can be damaging, um, and it can be very costly to move forward after you do that. Um, but if you don't go far enough, then you actually might not be able to achieve some of your health system objectives. Um, but in the past, I would uh, guess or I would hypothesize that Damagi uh, and other vendors that are working in a similar space were not necessarily thinking about health system objectives as much as they were, they're thinking about, you know, developing a product and a viable business um, and, you know, specific health outcomes on the individual level, which is very different than the health system. Um, and I think you can contrast that with things that Andy and Chris have said that were much uh, higher level, health system level. Uh, so I think, could you all just comment on, you know, what do you think is that optimum level of interoperability? Um, and what, um, I guess, are there some specific differences that you are seeing there now that uh, you are now moving more towards scale? Um, yeah, so thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't get to the end of this question. Oh. Sorry, can you repeat the end of your, the last part of your question? I, I sure, yeah, I guess the, the, <laughs> conclusion of that question was, uh, you know, has the optimum level of interoperability changed um, now that you're pushing towards scale? Um, and yeah, and I guess that's it. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, I think uh, one, of, one of the things, just speaking towards how the model should work out, like from, you know, from Damagi's perspective as like a mobile technology company and whatnot, is that we really rely on our clients to, to be the ones that know how to make good happen. <laughs> And as you know, as standards and interoperability become more of a like more of a health systems issue, then we've seen that priority rise, and so we're responding to that that need as it uh, appears in that marketplace. Speaking more broadly to what you said about you know different interoperabilities uh, for different pieces uh, in the puzzle, I definitely agree with that piece. Like I think it's it's useful uh, for you know, governments to be playing a role in the coordination of it, and they and it's great that they you know can learn lessons from what's going on in this space. Like someone needs to be establishing, uh, you know, some norms about how these systems can work together and government is well positioned to uh, play that role as well as these standards bodies and whatnot uh, that we have going. I guess what I'm, uh, you know, what I'm, I'm speaking up against is the idea that every, every small little pilot project needs to, uh, you know, lose sleep over making sure that they know how to do the interoperability piece right. I think, you know, we still have a of a, like we, I think we, in broad strokes, you know, we know things that, you know, medication reminders help people take their meds on time, but we don't, we're still learning so much and there's so much variability in these systems. And there are some projects that, um, admittedly, I'm, I'm probably talking about a smaller scale here, that are, are out there as learning projects. And, you know, it's only at a certain point uh, that it becomes really important to make sure uh, that you can feed all your data into all the other systems that are out there. But that point definitely does exist, you know, like if you actually realistically expect your project to, um, you know, be sustained by the Ministry of Health and you want them to be able to make decisions, then you want to make sure that all the data that you're collecting feeds into, it feeds into some sort of system that they can uh, use and manage uh, for decision making. And at that point it becomes a little bit more complex. There's also, there's also the other issue that, uh, you know, we have various different kinds of, like, health systems or para-health systems or whatnot. Like if you talk about a system which is just, you know, texting health information to people in the community, um, like there, that could be part of, you know, a medical record system, but it could just be, you know, some other advertising <coughs> type of system that needs to make sure that it knows how to talk to a system which is tapped into that health information exchange. So, you know, like, so there's, there's definitely, um, with technology in general, there's you know so many different uh, domains, and as long as you have your your in, uh, so that you can so that your information you know feeds in the part of your information that you have that's relevant to healthcare feeds into that larger health um, ecosystem, then then that's fine. That's all you need to care about. Does that address your question? Okay. Anyone else? I think we have time for one more. Um, I'm not sure who was here first. <laughs> <laughs> I got a simple one. Okay, let's go to the simple one. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate the presentations. Uh, the simple question is, uh, I actually am part of AIM North America, which is automatic identification data capture, and we have committees uh, working with governments called the Internet of Things. So the question was, are you, is the panel familiar 
with that work of the Internet of Things, because it talks about data capture and information transference between countries over the Internet. So it's just a yes or no, are you familiar with it? Because I'm intrigued of whether or not those government programs are actually, I call it, you know, one side of the government doesn't know what the other side of the government does. That never happens, of course, but. No. <laughs> nope. And no. interesting. No. All right, thank you. And then, <laughs> um, I do also want to just kind of echo one other thing that colleagues said today, which is, and also point people both to the mHealth, the Lions Hub system, as well as Hingex, um, because we do really all strongly share the principle of kind of create once, use many times. So we are sharing resources across that are use cases, requirements, standards, things that will take place in Rwanda can then be seen by someone who's deploying a project in Ghana. So to the extent that you all can tap into those resources as you think about how you might roll out uh, e-health projects in your country or look for research around that, that might also be, those two thing, places might be useful resources for you all. Um, thank you to our panel and uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs> you